Um, we're in week four, uh, maintaining your identity. Last week, it was living from your identity. But before we get into maintaining your identity, uh, let me do a quick review in case somebody wasn't here two weeks ago. And just to get our minds thinking along the lines, because we're just picking up from where we left off last time. Two weeks ago, we talked about our human makeup and that we are made of three parts, body, soul, which is our mind and emotions, and our spirits. And we talked about that we have been given a brand new spirit that's sealed with the Holy Spirit. The moment you ask Jesus into your life, that is yours. That is what every part of your homework is talking about, the redeemed, forgiven, saved. It's talking about who you really are, which is your spirit, which is eternal. God sees us spiritually. He sees us dead spiritually until he saves us, and then he sees us alive to Christ. And this is something that we have to accept by faith. We said two weeks ago that the Lord commands us to reckon ourselves uh, dead to sin and alive to Christ. Reckon, that means consider it, count on it, believe it, have faith in it. And we know that the facts of faith will always go against appearance. It will always go against what we're conscious of or it wouldn't be faith, right? Hebrews uh, 12 tells us that we have the uh, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the convictions of things that we can't see. So it doesn't feel like we're flawless. We are very aware of our sin. But God tells us to reconcile ourselves to that, to reckon, to consider it. Because that is what the core of living in freedom and joy means. It's the new attitude between the old self and the new self. It's the new attitude of your mind. And we exercise our faith when we rest in the facts of what God tells us in his word. That's, that's faith. And so we said that we always have a choice between letting the spirit reign king in our lives or letting this un, unredeemed part, our mind isn't redeemed yet, neither is our body. Well, our body, we're going to get a brand new body, girl, so that's good. But our mind is not redeemed yet. And so sanctification all through your life is lining up your thinking with who you are and the truth of what God's word says. That's sanctification. And so uh, Romans six twelve says, Let not sin, therefore, be reigning as king in your mortal body, that you should obey the desires of God. Of it, so I would I would recommend this is the core of your Christian faith that you've been made new. Only you didn't do one thing to deserve it, no effort. It was all by the grace of God, and that you put everything on the back burner until that sinks in to the very core. Until that phrase "under grace" becomes spectacular to you. Otherwise. Obeying is resting in that fact. Disobeying it is doubting it. And what that leads to is a prayer life of constantly struggling for something that's already yours. And it actually uh, contributes to us avoiding faith when we constantly refuse to believe that and doubt it. Does that make sense? God wants us to believe it and to rest in it. So today, our key word today is focus. How we maintain who we are in Christ and live that out is by what we focus on. And we're going to talk about, we focus on the grace that comes from the cross. The same grace that won us to Christ is the same grace that maintains our living for Christ. We focus on knowing and loving him. Every victory that we have in this, in this life stems from our fellowship and our intimate relationship with God. So that's where our focus should be. And our last is focus on purpose. We have said this over and over again. None of us are here by accident. You were designed for a purpose for his kingdom in this lifetime, and it will be for your joy and his glory when you step out into that. How many know <clears throat> that what you focus on grows? Whatever you focus on is going to grow in its influence on you. So I gave this to the small group ladies this morning. Um, the times that you've had the flu, 
and you're laying there and you're feeling so miserable. And the more you concentrate, the, the worse you feel. But if you get sidetracked and you, you talk to, to people, you read a book, you watch TV, you don't feel quite as bad. To this day, I can't watch them give me a shot because it just hurts worse when I see that needle go in. So what you focus on grows. And this is your first fill in the blank. Whatever captures your attention will grow in its influence on you. And uh, a great example of this is Peter. When he focused on Jesus, he could walk on water. But as soon as he focused on the problem and the circumstances around him, he began to sink. Do you know this is what Jesus did to get him through the cross? Your scripture on page 82 at the top, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, read that along with me. This comes after chapter 11, which lists the great patriarchs of the Bible who who demonstrated the faith that they had uh, in God. And so we pick it up with chapter 12. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, I'm sorry, to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this. Let's stop just a second here. We do what? So we're not just reading. We do what? We throw off the sin and we run our race with endurance by, and then continue, keeping our eyes on Jesus the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. We live from our identity the same way Jesus looked at the joy that was set before him, and that helped him endure everything in his 33 years of living here. And his last three years of ministry, he focused on the hope and the joy that was to come. We are to do the same thing. What what was the joy that that grew an influence in Jesus that helped him to get through? What is the joy? Because God's complete. He he did not make the world because he was lonely or he needed some friends. He was he's absolutely complete content, satisfied. He was in heaven with the angels. He had everything he needed. What was the joy that he didn't have before he came to earth? You and me. He didn't have us. Because remember, we were spiritually dead. We, we were controlled by our enemy before he saved us. It was the joy of fellowship with you and me that helped him to get through the crucifixion and all that he went through. He went through. Gosh, my mouth is dry. Um, so let's let's talk about specifically. Let's talk about focusing on the cross and what it does for us. We have said that all the needs that we have, the need to be accepted, the cross fulfills that. We are accepted by God. We said we need value. We have lots of value by the price that was paid at the cross. And we said that we have this natural, we want to control things. God won back the authority that we have in Christ at the cross. So those three things we gained. I'm going to give you three more that aren't listed in your notes. You might want to write these down. The first one is through focus on the cross, we're able to approach God. If God's wrath against sin didn't land on his son, do you realize it would have landed on each one of us? The only way that we can approach God is because of the cross. And so focusing on the tremendous blessing and mercy and grace that he shows us at the cross allows us to enter the throne room of God 24-7, enter his presence and talk to him, find out what's on his heart, share what's on our heart. That is because of the cross. Now listen, there is nothing that's going to get our focus off of the cross and off of God more than when we focus on ourselves. And it is our human, unredeemed nature that wants to do that. And we we call this something, we call this navel-gazing. As cute as that little baby is, 
That is what we are when we are constantly analyzing our behavior. Are we doing enough? Are we enough? Am I as good as the next person? Will God accept me the way I am? That struggle, if we don't, if we don't uh, determine to reckon ourselves dead to sin once and for all, saved, we constantly look at ourselves and wonder. And I will tell you right now, we've said this, you're not awesome. You will never be enough. So stop wondering if you're doing enough. And if you are enough, you either are or you aren't. And it's all based on God. It's not based on us. Um, God never wants us to remain stuck in self-analysis because it just produces um, striving and anxiousness in it. Uh, so what we're supposed to do is just what Hebrews 12 tells us to do. We, we throw off the weight. We repent. We take it to God and say, man, I'm struggling in this area. He says, yeah, I know. You repent. You turn. Ask him for his help. He's faithful to always forgive. And he puts you right back in harmony with him. But we don't sit there and get stuck. Because here's what happens. You will never find rest in what God's already done for you if you focus on yourself and your behavior. You're never going to find that rest that God wants you to have. And let me tell you, anything that disturbs your peace with God, anything that makes you feel um, anxious and that striving, you need to stop what you're doing, figure out, go down to the root, figure out what's causing that. Because when your belief is right, you're going to have that peace with God. If it's not right, you go to the foot of the cross and you say, Lord, I, I don't know. My thinking is wrong here. I am anxious. I keep trying to earn my salvation. I know it's not right. Lord, forgive me and help me to understand that it is totally by the cross that I'm saved. Um, read scripture. Read the truth that contradicts whatever it is that's giving you that anxious feeling. Um, because God wants you to be at peace with him. Um, that same gospel that won you to Christ Ladies, we got to quit listening to ourselves and we've got to start preaching to ourselves, right? We got to start preaching the gospel to ourselves every day, if not every hour and every minute. We have to remind ourselves the grace that is found at the cross. Otherwise, it steals the joy of our salvation. And so, remember this we have said this a couple of weeks ago. He saw you at your worst. And he still chose you. Remind yourself of that. The second thing that we get from focusing on the cross is we see our circumstances differently through the prism of the gospel. When you understand, when you think of your testimonies, what brought you to God in the first place? Think about the circumstances that surrounded that. If you were a Christian your whole life, you don't really remember a set time you've always believed. Think of the spiritual markers in your life and the circumstances like that. When do we cling to God more? When things are good or when things are bad? When things are bad. God knows that. Um, God knows that. And still, this is what we, this is what we get from Galatians 1, 15, 16. But even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. Then it pleased him. It pleased the father to reveal his son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. It pleases God to reveal the gospel and the, and the comfort of the blessing of grace to you. Um, so all of the circumstances that go on in your life, that is God shaping and molding you and taking you deeper in your faith. So we can rejoice even in the bad circumstances. God is sovereign over every detail every detail of your life and we can we can rest in that we can be assured that it pleases god when we rest in the grace even in the bad circumstances we rest that it pleased him to show his son to you pleased him we don't earn it and let me tell you nobody slips through god's fingers nobody does god is god he nobody slips through his fingers it's not dependent on you it's dependent on him. The third thing we get by focusing on the cross is we can extend the same grace to other people. So when you have people who've offended you or have been downright dirty to you, you can extend the same grace that God has extended to you because 
you didn't deserve that grace either. So I love litmus tests. We're going to take a few of them during this lecture. But the scripture is full of tests to show us where our hearts are. And so the first one is found in 1 John 2, 9. And we're actually going to come back to this for another test later on. But it says this, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. If you're not loving your brother, if you're holding a grudge, if there isn't forgiveness, you're not thinking through the gospel of the cross. You can't not forgive someone and think about the forgiveness that's been extended you at the same time. It's impossible. So your focus is off. When you can't forgive someone, that's kind of a litmus test as to where you are. So the last, the fourth thing, focusing on the cross, and we have talked about this to death, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. But when you focus on the cross, you automatically have to think, it's as if you died on the cross with Christ. You were dead to sin and alive to Christ. The Bible even says you've been crucified with Christ. That's how God sees you. You have to reckon that to be true in your own life. And so the next focus that we need to focus on is focus on knowing and loving God. Uh, I don't read from the Amplified Version, but uh, sometimes the scriptures in there are awesome, easy to understand. And so Philippians 3.10 is one that I took from there. It says, this is Paul speaking, For my determined purpose is that I may know him, that I may progressively progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly, and that I may in that same way come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection, which it exerts over believers, and that I may so share his sufferings as to be continually transformed in spirit, into his likeness, even to his death. This kind of goes back to the circumstances. He says that I may share in his sufferings so that I may be more transformed into his image. Suffering and transformation, they go together. So Paul is saying that his determined purpose is to know God and know the power of his resurrection. Determined means resolute, to be determined. Uh, firm in purpose, settling the dispute. Paul even said to live as Christ. So it was more than just knowing him. He just wanted to really intimately know him. So I want to share with you a conversation uh, between Jesus and Philip, who was one of his disciples. He was in the inner circle, and Jesus was kind of telling Philip, you can be walking as close as you are to me and totally miss the point of why I came. It says in, uh, or in John 14, 8, it says, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? God is saying, Jesus is saying to us, you can go to church every Sunday You can read your scripture. You can do all of this and miss the point of knowing intimately your father. Jesus is making a distinction between informational knowledge and personal experiential knowledge. So if you sat down with a person, you're going to need information. You're going to need to know, well, tell me about yourself. Are you married? Are you single? Do you work? Stay home? It's informational knowledge. If you two click and you want it to go to a friendship, you're going to start learning about their passions, what they care about, what makes them happy, what makes them sad. You're going to go deeper. So you can have informational knowledge and not go any further than that. Or, but you can't, I'm sorry, but you can't have personal knowledge without having informational knowledge. Am I totally confusing you all? So it's, per, it's possible to have all this information about God and never really, really, really know him. And so Christianity is all about personal relationship with him. Jesus' main point in coming to planet Earth is so that you could know his father. That's his main point. So if we're not making that our determined purpose, why is it in our society do you think that that could be? 
Could this maybe ring a bell? Busy. We're so busy. Um, and I will tell you, not every society is that busy. Um, I, I don't remember if I said this in here or not, but we once lived by a, a guy that was here for a two-year stint from Britain, and I was out raking my leaves on a Sunday. Did I tell you that? And he came up to me. He says, do you Americans never stop working? He says, you guys are always busy. And I stopped and thought, that's true. I never looked at it from, a, from somebody else's perspective. But do you know that busy means burden under Satan's yoke? If you don't have time to spend with God, getting to know him in that personal way, there is something on your plate that God didn't put there because God would never have made your life so busy that you didn't have time for him. You put it there. And it could be an absolutely good, wonderful thing. But you need to, if you're so busy that you don't have time to spend getting to know God, you need to ask God, Lord, what is it on my plate that I did not put there? And, and God help us. We are teaching our children to follow our footsteps. I mean, a lot of you have young children. I think sports are great. My husband and I were athletic. We had our kids in sports. Um, Lots of good things, character building, teamwork, all of that stuff. But not three, four, five sports. Not three, four, five activities. Not two if you don't have time. If you're not teaching your child the things that are eternal, the things that will keep pushing him towards his heavenly father, but it's all about soccer and basketball, how foolish is that? How much of a leg up would you have had if your parents, and I don't know what your backgrounds are, but if my parents would have really pushed spending time with God before you come down for breakfast? For a toddler, spend two minutes. Say a quick prayer to Jesus before you come down for breakfast. They get a little bit older. Here's a paragraph of a devotion. Read that. I'm going to ask you about it when you come down for breakfast. That eternal has more eternal value than all these activities we're teaching our kids. And we almost wear that badge of busyness with honor. This is the value I have. I'm so busy. I've got so much value. We've got to stop that. That is, a, that is a lie that's in our culture, and it's, it's, it is not good for our relationship. The blessing of Christianity is to really, really know God. I have shared this with the small group leaders, and I know I've shared this with other small groups that I have visited. I don't remember. I'm so sorry if I have said this again. Uh, If you're watching the video, just kind of fast forward through this. But Jesus talks about busyness in the uh, whole thing of Mary and Martha. Uh, If you're not familiar with it, they had Jesus over for a dinner party. Mary and Martha are sisters. Martha's busy cooking. She's setting the table. She's doing everything. Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to him teach. And Martha was a little bit upset and said, Jesus, aren't you going to have her help me? And he turned to her. And anytime you see this in Scripture where they say a name twice, it's, it's a term of endearment. So Jesus loved Martha. He wasn't reprimanding. He said, Martha, Martha, you are anxious about so many things. Mary's got the one thing that's, ne- that's needed, and I won't take that from her. When I looked up that word anxious, it means divided. So it would be like him saying, Martha, Martha, you're divided over so many things. So that anxiousness of, oh, I got so much to do today, I got so much to do today, that means you're divided. You're divided. You're too divided. Ask God, what is it on my plate that I need to take off? Uh, simplify. To make time for him and to get to know him. He will help you get everything done that you need to get done if he comes first. Um, That's where our focus needs to be. That's what we need to remember when we feel that anxiousness. Um, You know, if I would ask everybody in this room, what is the most important thing in your life? All of you as Christians would say, God's the most important thing in my life. Everything comes behind that. But God is saying in this story, Mary has got the one thing. Jesus wants to be your life. He wants to walk with you moment by moment, guiding and showing you, letting you decide, blessing your decision. I mean, it's a joint thing. 
And so that's where our focus needs to be. Now, I'm going to give you a litmus test because we are absolutely cheating ourselves from an abundant life when we don't know God intimately. In fact, 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do not do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? So this is on the bottom of page 83. There's four parts of this test. The first one's internal. The last three are external. They are all coming from the book of 1 John 2, verses 3 through 21. And I'll, I'll give you verse 3 on the screen, and we'll get started. We know that we have come to know him If we obey his commands, that word for no in the Greek is ginosko, G-I-N-O-S-K-O. It actually means it's it's a word uh, for sexual relations. It is an uh, experiential fellowship with God. It is an entering into one another, having deep discussions as as though you were married. Tell me what's on your heart. Tell me what what you're passionate about. Let me share you let me share with you what I'm passionate about. It's a it's like a marriage discussion when you're with God. Now Adam in back in Genesis it says Adam knew Eve and she bore a son. That no is the same word. It it connotates a jointness, a oneness. So your first one is internal. It's an experiential test and it it's uh, fellowship with God is the premise of it. Um, and, and it is knowing him is when you are reading scripture. Um, and it is like he is sitting right next to you and he's reading it to you. It is, it is experiencing him talking to the deepest part of your heart. Sometimes it's real soft. Sometimes it's real heavy and it's different for everybody. Sometimes when I sense his presence, I just tremble physically because it's so powerful. Other people don't have that experience. They have other experiences. But it is, it is a knowing that you know that you are in the presence of the Almighty God, that he's there. It is a relationship, and it has to be there for the assurance of your salvation. You have to know him intimately. So, Um, let me ask you a few questions. Do you know God like that? Can you sense his presence when you're with him in fellowship? Do you say your prayers and you know that you know that you know that he's hearing every word? And do you know that he answers every one of those prayers? There is nothing in scripture that gives us any information about unanswered prayers. He answers all of them. Maybe not right then. Maybe it's a week later. Maybe it's a month later. But he answers all of them. It's always with a yes or a no or a later. But he answers them. Do you know God like that? Do you trust him? This test is for you. It's not for anybody else. And I'm just reading what's in the scripture. Um, The second test is an external test. And this is a behavior test. This is found in 1 John 2, 4 through 6. And it says this. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. So the second one is a behavior test. And did you hear that at the end? We must walk as Jesus did, not by self-effort. It is all done by gratitude from the cross, the the grace that he has showed us. One thing that I notice about um, when an unbeliever comes to Christ, you can tell the first thing that changes is their language. If they use foul language, you can tell they start becoming aware of their language and, and they start catching themselves. If somebody has been raised in the church, but they have a moment of, oh my gosh, I never really knew him like that, You can usually tell when it sinks in because they have this insatiable hunger to know more. Those are kind of clues that God is working in their heart. So let me ask you these questions. Are you growing in character? Are you walking as Jesus walked? 
Are you making progress? Are you becoming less irritable, less fearful, less moody, less grumpy, more joyful, more self-controlled? All the fruits of the Spirit, or do you notice that they're growing? If you really want to stick your neck out in faith, ask your spouse. Ask a best friend. Honey, can you, can you see that I'm growing in joy and kindness and from last year? And see what he says. They'll give you, unfortunately, they'll just go right to the chase. They'll be honest with you. Um, This is how you can tell if you really, really know God. You're going to be growing in your character. That's a sure sign. Um, 1 John, this is the third one. It's a relational test. It's based on verses 7 through 11. I'm just going to read 9 through 10 for the sake of time. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. So the third one is a relational test, Um, and it's based on love. It's just not general love. It means love for your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a deep love. So let me ask you some questions. Are you enjoying relationships with other Christians? Are there people that you would never have been friends with, probably, had not it been for the connection you have of Christianity? Are you staying reconciled with people? Are you the instigator of reconciliation and peace amongst other brothers and sisters? Have you forgiven everyone in your sphere of life? Those are all clues as to how well you know God. And how close your relationship is. is. The fourth test is a, a doctrinal test. This is in, it starts in verse 18. We're just going to read 21 and 22 for the sake of time. It says, I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it and because no lie comes from the truth. Whoever is the liar, or who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ, such a person as the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. Do you truly believe the truth of the gospel, that Jesus is God's Son, that he is um, your Savior, that he has paid the total price? One of the ways you can tell that is in your homework on page 53, I had asked, what are some ways that you can tell that you've been redeemed? And Ephesians 1, 12, and 14 It says in both of those verses, to the praise and the glory of God. When you understand how great God's grace is to you, you just want to shout. You just want to praise his name. You just want to make much of him. Amazing grace brings tears to your eyes because you experience that grace on a daily basis. So let me ask you, are you growing in your ability to rejoice in the gospel? Are you growing in joy as you reflect and meditate on his amazing grace towards you? Are you saying, I'm a Christian only by the complete grace of God, and it almost surprises you? You are just amazed by his grace. These are great tests and diagnostic tools to help you determine where you are and how well and intimately you know God. If there's anything wrong with your walk, if you are filled with doubts, if God doesn't seem real to you, if you're dry spiritually, you're lacking spiritual vitality, and you wonder, what's wrong with me? Go back to these tests and and look and see, is your character changing? Look at the behavior test. Are you doing things that violate your conscience? Look at your relationships. Are you bitter or isolated or unforgiving? Look at the doctrinal test. Do you really understand the complete grace of God? This is a great diagnostic test for you to go back to. And go to God and ask him, Lord, I'm struggling with this. I'm str- Be honest with him. I need your help. He puts the desires in your heart. Ask him. So how can we get to know God? Four practical ways we can get to know God. One is spend time with him. We cannot in ourselves, um, we can't drum up love for God unless the Holy Spirit in us puts those desires and that and he reveals things about God and you begin to love him more and more. 
Um, for this, we need to separate ourselves from the world, get in our quiet place, and spend fellowship time. I told the girls in a small group this morning, there is tremendous things that God does in your heart in your prayer time. You're not even aware of them. But he is, he is working things in you as you pray. It is hugely important that you spend that time with God in prayer. Romans 5.5 5 tells us that through the Holy Spirit, God's love is poured out within our hearts. Take time to fellowship so that he can pour his love into your heart and you see a clear vision of him. The next thing is to meditate on his word. You can read scripture and then go on about your business, but meditate is something different. There's some benefit to reading, but meditation, it'd be the same thing if you, had a, uh, if you were making tea and you put a tea bag in your boiling water and then you drank it and didn't let it steep. Meditation is letting it steep. Read something. If you have a question, don't go any further. Say, Lord, he's your teacher. Just like when his feet were on planet Earth. He's your teacher when you're reading scripture. What does this mean? What does this tell me about you? What does this tell me about me? How do I apply this in my situation? Ask him those things. Think about it. God is faithful. He will, he will walk you through that. Meditate. <clears throat> Hold on to a promise like this. I love this. John fourteen twenty one. He that loveth me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. That's a promise. He'll manifest himself in a million different ways. He manifests his love to you. <clears throat> Meditate on his word. The third one is become familiar with his ways. Um, a couple years ago, I read the scripture and... Um, and it, it really spoke a lot to me. It's Psalm 103.7. It says, he made, way, he made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. And what that means is Israel was very familiar with all the deeds of God. He provided manna. Their sandals never wore out. Um, water when they needed it. They were familiar with his deeds. But Moses took it a step further. He was familiar with the deeds, but he took it up to who was the creator of those deeds. And it showed him a lot about God's character. So let me ask you, let me, let me just ask you, can a non-believer and a believer both enjoy a glass of wine? Yes. Can they both enjoy a nice juicy steak? Yes. Um, can they enjoy um, a good sex life? Yes. But they can never enjoy the fullness of any one of those things when it just ends on the deed and it doesn't go up to who gave them that. So when you're having a nice um, steak, Lord, thank you for inventing cows, for creating those cows and all those stomachs and all that fat and the marbleizing. And, and thank you for that chef who had the wisdom to know how to perfectly cook it. You know, God only promises us food, shelter, and clothing. He never promised the steak. I love cookie dough ice cream. That is a blessing that he lets me enjoy. He wouldn't have had to do that. He could have created a world where you had the same outfit all your life. <laughs> And you, um, you know, you had manna every day and uh, you had shelter and you lived in the same place. He could have designed a world like that. But look what he all gives us to enjoy. He created that. Get familiar with who's giving you all these blessings. It's his nature. I was telling the girls this morning, uh, we got a cat about a year and a half ago, just a little bitty six-week-old kitten. We have a farm behind us and uh, lots of mice, and we wanted an outdoor cat. We got a screened-in porch, and I was out there listening to praise music and had my eyes shut. This little cat uh, jumps up, and it's on its back on my lap, swatting at the wires to my earplugs. And I looked down, and here's this gray and white kitten with brilliant blue eyes that were just playing. And the cuteness was just amazing. And it was just like a whoosh. God said, I made that. I invented cuteness. See, I have struggled with, with picturing, because my dad was very um, regimented. I picture God, and I have to constantly be reminded of his grace. And he gave me a picture that morning. This is who I am. I value kittens. I value babies. I value puppies. I created that. That is part of who I am. 
And that gave me a whole different view. I just cried my eyes out, and it's like, oh, God, I never have seen that side of you. I've never seen that. Get familiar with his ways by what he gives us. When, when the Bible says, uh, give praise always, that's what it's talking about. Be aware of everything. It's from him. Every good thing comes from him. Get to know him through what, how he blesses you. Be familiar with that. And the last one, get to know God through your circumstances. Beth Moore had once said, um, if we all wrote a book, the front of the book would say knowing God. We could decorate it individually. They would all look different. But every chapter of your life would start off knowing God. So when you would page through that book, it would have different seasons of your life. The good things, the bad things, the joyful times, the sad things, but all of them encompassed how we get to know God. Get to know God through, through um, your circumstances. What is he trying to teach you? Get to know him, how he answers your prayers. You can learn a lot about him by how he answers your prayers, all of those things, but make it your determined purpose to get to know him. There is no greater joy than that on planet earth, and it is open for every human being. So the last thing is to get to know is your purpose. Um, And I just want to share this. God's presence represents his glory. So when, when you see the word glory in scripture, a lot of times it's talking about the very presence of God. And when you see God's anointing, it's talking about God's power for a specific purpose that he has for you on your life. And so knowing that God wants you not only to know him in knowledge, like we said before, he wants you to experience him, experience his love, experience his faithfulness, experience the power that he gives you to complete whatever purpose you have. So let's talk about your purpose. Let's talk about everybody's broad purpose here for just a second. Do you know that God's very nature is he is just a dweller among people? In the Garden of Eden, he dwelt with Adam and Eve. Then Moses came and he had him with, with minute detail make the tabernacle, and he dwelt there. And then with Solomon, he gave minute detail to his father David, and Solomon built a temple because he wanted to dwell there. When Jesus came and the Holy Spirit, he's given you a new spirit and you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, you are now where he dwells. You have the mind of Christ if you let him have control. And so 1 Corinthians 6.19, it says, Don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. He dwells in us. And just like the incredible detail he put in the tabernacle and the temple, he puts incredible detail in each one of us. Uh, Abilities, um, passions, um, knowledge. He he forms us with specific purposes in mind. And the huge, I mean, we have to wonder, every uh, thing that you were reading about in your homework, Let me ask these questions. Why has he blessed us with every spiritual blessing? Why has he chosen us before the foundation of the world? Why has he adopted us? Why has he redeemed us? Why has he lavished his forgiveness on us? Why does he continually pour his grace upon us? Why does he give us wisdom and insight according to his infinite riches? What is his overall purpose for us? It's to dwell with us. And everything in history is coming to this end. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. That's our purpose. Our purpose is to expand his kingdom. And this will happen. We will all get to see this. Every knee will bow. Now, you were part of that plan. You were part of that purpose. And he's dwelling in you to accomplish that purpose. So our specific purpose is the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Our purpose is to continue Christ's ministry when he was here on earth. 
That's our purpose. That is our number one purpose. If you've got little kids, that is your mission field right now. Your whole purpose is to get them connected with God. If you are out of the childbearing years and you were on your own, God has a ministry for you. It is all for his purpose. It is all for his purpose. And so <clears throat> we have access to him 24 hours. He shapes us. So he guides us. He has already shaped us. He is the potter. We're the clay. We start off as a lump of clay, and he molds us into the most beautiful things, but for one purpose. It is to further his kingdom. God has planned how he will use you for kingdom works. You are not here by accident. And the key is he wants us to be completely, completely dependent on him for every turn, every decision we make. So to end this today, Colossians 3.1 says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. I want to ask you a question because I don't want this just to be conceptual knowledge. I want it to be, I want it to go to the heart. If you have been raised with Christ, is there a seriousness in your heart about the things of God? Are you seriously making it your determined purpose to know him? Do you think about why you're here? Or are we so busy in this temporal things that don't last that we are, we are sidetracked from that goal? These are questions you need to ask yourself. It's not for anybody else. And it could be coming here is one of the ways. But how does that play itself out in your life? If the things above are front and foremost in your life, how does that play out on a day-to-day basis? What fruit are you seeing in your life on a day-to-day basis? These are questions we need to examine ourselves with. Um, We have to make sure that our focus is right. Are we going to do this perfect every day? Absolutely not. But we should see more and more days that are focused on Jesus. The more we spend time with him, the more he becomes center in our life and see less and less days that we walk without him.